Hi, everyone. I cannot believe you're all here at three o'clock on your last day of classes. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, yeah, and thank you so much to Cal Poly Slow and to Dr. Taylor for having me. This is awesome. I've never done a talk like this on wildlife photography. So it was really, I guess, like therapeutic and cathartic to get all my thoughts on screen, not on paper, but you know. Um, so I've been photographing for the last like 13 years or so. Um, I got into reptiles and amphibians and photography kind of at the same time. Um, reptile and amphibian photography really inspired me. Um, just so you know, all of the photos in this presentation were taken by me, unless otherwise noted. Uh, this is a Perengues adarum. Don't worry, we'll talk about that photo in a little while. So there we go. I've kept this talk really super simple, kept it to two different sections. First, we have the basics of nature and wildlife photography. Then we'll get into the ethics of everything. This is a wild tiger in Rantham Moor National Park in India. So hit the real basics, who, what, when, where, why of wildlife photography. Now, as with all art, photography is very personal. So disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of Marissa and do not necessarily reflect the views and positions of all wildlife photographers. Thank you very much. Some of you might recognize this animal from our Mojave field trip. Um, while we go through this presentation, I'd like you to think about these, the answers to a couple of questions. So why are you photographing wildlife? What impact are you having while you're photographing? And what impact do you and your photos have on your audience? So we'll start with who. Who is a wildlife photographer? Well, I am. Um, I'll take a second to tell you about me and my journey into wildlife photography and herpetology. Uh, we'll get into the DeLorean real quick, go back to about 1998 or so. I'm on a hike with my Girl Scout trip out on Mount Diablo in the East Bay. Our troop leader was right in front of us. She was in the lead and all of a sudden she walked by a rock and that rock started buzzing. And it was my first wild rattlesnake and I freaked out, had a full on like panic attack. Uh, the snake just sat there and rattled, or at least I think it did. I don't know. I ran away screaming. Um, this is the individual of that species that I'm sure you all know very well, the Northern Pacific rattlesnake. My next interaction with rattlesnakes came about a decade later in 2008 or so when I was out camping with my dad in Zion National Park. I was went for an evening walk down at a river, thought it'd be a nice way to relax, got down there, got buzzed by rattlesnakes, about five of them in about 100 feet. Uh, promptly turned around, went back to the car, never saw a single one, just heard the buzzes and the rocks. Um, I'm sure those are great basin rattlesnakes. I still haven't seen one, which is why this photo is missing. <laughs> um, they've now become my white whale. I wish I could remember what campground that was. Can't remember. It wasn't until college that I found an appreciation for reptiles and amphibians uh, through this guy. His name is Alex, Dr. Alex Crone. Um, he was obsessed with reptiles and amphibians or what we call herps and his obsession became mine. We'd go from trips to, from our college in Ohio, all over the East coast, down to Florida and everything. Here we are in 2009 with a pair of queen snakes from Michigan. Please note that he is holding his snake completely incorrectly. Do not hold snakes by their tail. Um, and also check out my real stylish footwear. I'm, I'm wearing a little nicer shoes this time, but you know, fever and five fingers were totally a jam back then. So I was on one of those trips. We went down to Florida and I took this photo. This is my very first photo of a venomous snake. And y'all, I was so proud. Dude, that was awesome. I was like, this is the best photo ever of a Florida cottonmouth. I am amazing. So I ended up finding photography through herping. Um, back before Facebook became the behemoth it is now, there used to be a website called the Field Herp Forum. And it's still around today, but it's kind of a shadow of what it once was. Um, but back then, people would like spend hours posting trip reports with tons of photos from all these trips around the world. Um, and some of those posts had really photo heavy, heavy, and they used to say D-U-W. I meant dial-up warning. Now, I recognize that most people in this room have no idea what dial-up is, but it basically meant that those posts would break your internet because there were so many photos in them. Uh, I fell in love with herping by looking at posts on the forum, and I fell in love with photography by seeing the really good photos that were in some of those posts. And in about 2010, I bought my first DSLR. Now, this is one of my early photos that I took, um, and I posted it on Field Herp Forum. This is the rarest rattlesnake in the United States. It's the Crotalus willidae obscurus, the New Mexican ridge-nosed rattlesnake. Um, I found this animal with help from a group of friends that were brought together by that Field Herp Forum. Now everything's on Facebook or TikTok or whatever the kids are using these days. Um, so why did I tell you all that? In today's society, it seems like most of us forget that people can change. I went from someone who literally ran away from rattlesnakes, screaming, to having this on my license plate. I'm the one on the left here, I'm Crow. 
um, which is short for the genus of Crotalus of the genus of rattlesnakes. I wouldn't be a herper had I never met another passionate herper. I would never be a photographer without the photographers on the forum. People change, education is important, representation is important. So who else are wildlife photographers besides just me? It's not just me in this. I'm sure most of you have seen Ratatouille, the movie. Great movie, you should definitely see it, great movie. Uh, remember the main celeb celebrity chef, Chef Gusto. He says anyone can cook. It's the same thing with photography. Anyone can do photography, especially with cell phones. Like our cell phones can capture amazing photos. That's with my phone. This is Hydromantis platycephalus. Um, and yeah, I took that with my phone. So smartphones, reasonably pr priced point and shoots, they've really helped to level the playing field in photography. So this is who came up when I Googled wildlife photographer. If you look at the landscape of nature photographers, it's not hard to notice a trend. As with all art, representation is incredibly important. And when there's unequal representation, stories and perspectives that deserve to be told are being lost. So everybody says it's because it's too expensive. Wildlife photography is too expensive. Um, look, photography equipment can be very expensive. I'm not going to lie. I have a lot of really good gear that I've built up after over 10 years of working, and it's not a cheap hobby. That being said, new camera gear is coming out all the time, all the time, and you don't have to have the best and brightest. This photo right here of this Obscurus was taken with a Rebel T1i, the, like, that, they're up to T7i's now, and a Tamron 90 mil. That's still kind of expensive for that lens. Um, I think I sold mine for like $80 because I think it had mold in it. Still took good photos, but took a little bit more post-processing. Um, but basically my point is you don't need the latest and greatest gear. You can take compelling, beautiful wildlife photos with some very reasonably priced gear now. For example, this photo, one of my favorites, um, these ladybugs are totally alive. They're totally fine. They do this every winter where they basically can get frosted over, snowed over, and then when it warms up, they melt and they go around the merry way. They're convergent ladybugs. I took that photo with an Olympus TG6 point and shoot, right? You can pick it up for 150 bucks. That being said, I also took this with an Olympus point and shoot. So, you know, spirit of transparency here, whatever. But basically my point is for in the fight for representation and wildlife photography, the price tag is the least of our worries. So let's move on to some more nuanced issues. You know, we could talk all day about the challenges to representation of wildlife photography and how to rectify it. I don't know if anybody was at the TWS at the Wildlife Society meeting this year, but Joel Sartori, one of the greatest wildlife photographers who's actually made a living out of him, good for him. Um, he, I asked him uh, during the keynote speech, like, what do you think about representation of wildlife photography? And his response was kind of like, oh, there's representation, it's fine. I get it. Super complicated issue. Hard to answer when you're staring at a bunch of faces and it's a huge discussion. Um, there's not one solution. So I'm willfully ill-equipped to think of all the challenges or come up with effective solutions. Try to just brainstorm a few for this talk. First, we have the very standard clear issues. Loss of funding in the arts, loss of funding in STEM, because wildlife photography is both art and science. So in addition to this, I'd actually like to add um, uneven access to extracurricular outreach programs. I don't know about you guys, I didn't learn how to identify what was in my backyard in class in school, in high school or middle school or anything. I didn't learn any of that there. I learned about the Krebs cycle, photosynthesis, but I didn't actually learn how to identify that frog, even though it's one of the most common vertebrates here in California. I learned that, actually, I don't even know if I learned that in, in Girl Scouts, but I learned how to identify birds and I learned, learned how to identify some plants in Girl Scouts, in summer camps, in extracurricular outreach programs. Not everybody has access to those. So um, I really didn't honestly begin to, um, to learn how to identify these common species that are in all of our backyards until college. And that's a problem because it adds to the perceived a distance of nature, that unattainability. Um, it's nature becomes something that happens to other people and not something that's all around us. Um, so this is one of my favorite quotes. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. We will understand only what we're taught. Looking at this from a human perspective, conservation is reliant on the general public caring for the world around them visibility of the natural world in our everyday lives. Some botanists call this lack of awareness of plants, plant blindness. And I think that that also 
uh, it happens to nature in the natural world in general, not just with plants. If nature is perceived as something that happens to other people in other places, conservation in every community is uh, an even more uphill battle. I think it's getting better. I hope it's getting better. I mean, check this out. Bar these are literal Barbies. Uh, they make a whole collection in partnership with National Geographic. Yes, this is my picture because my mommy bought me Barbies in 2019 and they were the best Christmas present ever. <laughs> so from left to right, we have astrophys astrophysicist Barbie, polar marine biologist Barbie, wildlife conservationist Barbie, and of course, my favorite, photojournalist Barbie. Um, there's also entomologist Barbie, which comes with her own little tree house and a bunch of bugs and like a bug catching net. And there's Jane Goodall Barbie. Like, this is awesome. Like this kind of representation really matters. I'm so happy that these exist. Oh, I have them all by the way. Um, and I hopefully these will help to normalize women in the sciences and uh, sciences and in photography. This is really, really cool. All right, let's move on to what? We just blew through a super complicated issue. We could like come for beers later. Let's Let's chat about um, who and representation and ways to fix it and what you can do about it and what we can all do about it. Uh, but we'll be stuck here forever if I just dove in. So let's go moving on to what? What is wildlife photography? We're gonna go really basic here. According to Wikipedia, <laughs> wildlife photography is a genre of photography concerned with documenting various forms of wildlife in their natural habitat. Great, wildlife, natural habitat, we got it. This photo is of a Namaqua dwarf adder, Bittish schneideri. This is the smallest viper species in the world. They top out at like this big, so tiny. Um, we found, uh, this is where we found this animal in these dune systems in Southern Namibia. Um, I did pose it for this photo, but we can all agree this photo documents wildlife in its natural habitat, fits the definition of wildlife photography. Alrighty, you're all biologists, what's wildlife? We know we all know we're in the Anthropocene. Humankind has had a massive impact on the world around us. People have very different ideas of what species are considered wildlife. Check out this. I'm going to open up the whole can of worms and talk about wild equines real quick because that's a anyway. We'll close the can of worms in a bit. Um, here are some wild donkeys in Southern California. Congress named wild burros and horses quote living symbols of the West in 1971. They've been on the landscape for like the last 500 years or so since about the 1500s, but the debate rages on whether they're a detrimental invasive or a reasonably harmless non-native. But regardless, this is a domesticated species that's outside of its native range, which is historically Africa. All right, then take it one step further. It's a dog on some ruins. Sure, dogs were domesticated around 7,000 BCE. We have some trolls in chat. Oh, the trials and tribulations of doing Zooms. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing okay. All right. Um, so let me share again, hopefully with less uh, comments from the peanut gallery. Yes. Um, anyway, so even smart, sweet, lovely Mark Hamill wasn't immune to the allure of these viral photos. He tweeted the one I was just sharing as his uh, favorite Frog Friday. But thankfully, my friend and excellent frog researcher, Dr. Jonathan Colby, saw the tweet and took the minute not to berate Mark Hamill for tweeting the photo, but to educate him on how these cute photos involve poor treatment of animals. And Mark was so gracious about it. Love that. So fortunately, these Problems of this trend are being noticed, as this article from PBS shows, though that doesn't stop people from continuously sharing these photos. Uh, my hope is that the next time that you see a wildlife photograph shared on social media, you take a minute to see behind, behind the art to the science underneath. How was this taken? Where was it taken? What does it really show? If you see them, these, these photos like this shared with friends and family, um, be like Dr. Colby. Take a minute to educate without judgment. Hopefully your audience has a little of Mark Hamill's graciousness and humility in them. And this isn't even getting into the whole issue of AI art. This is not what baby peacocks look like. <laughs> this post has 287,000 views. It's popped up all over my Facebook feed and um, with the non-ironic caption of, isn't nature amazing? It's like, y'all, education is really important. <laughs> so the way I see it, there's two camps of photographers, those who are in search of the art and those who are trying to document. Art photographers prioritize the photo above all else. 
document photographers sacrifice the photo for the story and of course the well-being of the animal on the right here i have a photo that i took of a glossy snake in the mojave with many of you um as a as it crossed the road right and this is exactly how i encountered the snake headlights catching it as it crossed the road at night is it going to win any awards no is it that artistically pleasing not really does it tell a better more truthful story than that photo on the left yeah sure does you're at my talk, you get to hear my opinion. Personally, as a biologist and a photographer, I find inspiration in what would exist if we weren't around, had we never been on the landscape. I find it difficult to photograph non-native species. Uh, I generally like to join on my friends' owling adventures, but I have little interest in going to go see the barred owl in California. It's just, I'd rather see them in Michigan. Um, even though I love horses, photographing wild horses in the Great Basin just doesn't really do it for me. Um, if time machines are real, I would love to go back to the California before European influence when birds blotted out the sun and the native people had no word for hunger. I mean, how cool would that be? So cool. See the Central Valley, just an actual delta. And I mean, the, uh, actually, anyway, I would be freaking awesome. So let's go back to this quote and read it again with a focus on the subject this time. Again, conservation is dependent on the public's understanding of what nature is. If the only representation of nature that we see in the media is of non-native animals or of animals in unnatural situations, people are going to care about those non-natives so much more than the, the potentially less flashy natives. Photography is a powerful tool to educate the public about wildlife and nature. This leads me into why. Why do wildlife photography? Of course, why someone does any art is deeply personal. Uh, it'll, it'll differ drastically from person to person. So, you know, this is here. This is my opinion. This is my personal philosophy and why I do what I do. The goal of wildlife photography is to create engagement with the natural world through photographs. The goal of that engagement is conservation through recognition and understanding. Now, if we think about this from a marketing standpoint, we consider conservation as a brand. What I'm trying to do is build brand recognition. I yoinked this graphic from an article called How to Build Brand Awareness and Why It's So Important by Reboot Online. Most of the people listening to this seminar, we're up here. We eat, we sleep, we breathe biology. It's deeply ingrained in our souls. Most of us have dedicated our lives to studying conservation of the natural world, but most of the general public is down here. They don't have very much awareness. Maybe, you know, maybe they're around here between no awareness and recognition. Um, we can't expect everyone to care as deeply about the natural world as we do. We don't care about their passions in the same way that they do. Um, but just like with advertising, goal is top of mind, but I'm gonna go ahead and settle for recall and recognition. Finally, we fully understand why this quote is so impactful. It aligns perfectly with that brand awareness pyramid. I know this sounds extremely corporate, I get it. But the thing is, is that, do you know how much money goes into corporate advertising, like research, like tons. So let's take that research and apply it to conservation. Teaching leads to recognition, which leads to overall recall and understanding, finally to love and conservation. So let's go back to this comparison. The photo on the left is engaging. Like all art, makes you feel something. If you don't really know what the underlying story and how we got that photo, which involved glue, you might think it's cute. You know, makes you feel happy, maybe. Or if you do know how it's found, it makes you feel real angry. Um, but anyway, it's undeniably art. Um, and fortunately, it does nothing with our brand conservation awareness pyramid. Doesn't raise awareness or to, of any of these species. Doesn't increase recall or recognition of these species. The photo on the right, however, tells a story. Snakes are on the roads at night. The next time someone's driving down the road at night, maybe they'll think of this photo and be able to spot a snake on the road and break for it. That photo has not, that person has now gone from no awareness to re recognition, maybe even to recall. And I call that a conservation win. Those little tiny wins are still wins. So how can we increase this conservation brand awareness? Well, that's that sweet spot between art and documentation. That's where wildlife photography lies. Truly impactful wildlife photos are engaging and memorable and tell the truth about the natural world. They are both art and science like this photo. This is one of the most heartbreaking photographs I've ever seen. Most people in this room recognize it. This is a photo by Joel Sartori showing dead Southern mountain yellow-legged frogs, which are random muscosa, who they've been killed by chytrid fungus. The photo is excellent. It's an excellent example of finding the balance between art and documentation. 
It swept the world, helped to bring the public's conservation brand awareness of frogs and their plight up towards recognition and recall. Because the photo is artistically pleasing, it was printed in newspapers, magazines, circulated online, went viral. And again, it helped the public re recognize and recall the plight of these frogs because of chytrid and the des destruction that chytrid is capable of. Independent of the subject matter, the photo is gorgeous. It's perfectly lit. It's composed. It's a gorgeous mountain scene. It's great. This is that beautiful intersection between art and documentation. I only started calling myself a wildlife photographer last year, which uh, honestly is just silly. You don't have to make money off of this to consider yourself a wildlife photographer. Boy, if you can pull that off, congratulations. Um, I just started vending at farmer's markets and I weighed, made a whopping 150 bucks last weekend. Um, <laughs> if you're in this for the money, honestly, you're in it for the wrong reasons. Everyone can photograph these days. People can print for cheap. They just don't buy photography anymore. It's just not the point. But this is why I do it. I may never take a photo like Joel's that changes the world and brings attention to an ecological disaster, but I can bring awareness to, of snakes and other biodiversity by sharing my photos with every audience. This was at the Marin Farmer's Market a few months ago. I took this photo and I'm sharing it now with her mother's permission. She picked up this photo of an Eastern coach whip and wouldn't let it go. I don't make money at farmer's markets, but that's not why I vended them. This is why I do it. If my photos can inspire and educate this one little girl, great success, happy, glad to do it. So my photo, the, my local farmer's market brings me the last of our W's are where? Short answer, everywhere. Taking photos of the wildlife around your neighborhood, showing the interaction between wildlife and our urban environments helps to bring that level of no awareness up to recall and recognition. This cedar waxing photo is taken in my backyard, um, right outside my window. In the spirit of education, he's eating privet. Privet is a terrible invasive. The birds eat it. They go to our riparian areas that poop the seeds out and those seeds sprout into these big trees that shade out all natives underneath them. So Privet's bad, remove your privet. This is in my neighbor's yard. I can't do anything about it. Um, it also brings all the birds to my yard. Um, because of the prevalence of our fruit bearing ornamentals, wax wings in particular are surprisingly common in our urban environments. I used to get them in San Francisco all the time when I lived there. They have an extremely recognizable call. They're absolutely gorgeous. I mean, look at that eyeliner. I love it. Um, <clears throat> So sharing photos of these lovely, lovely birds with your neighbors and other local social circles is a great way to help those who are nature blind care more about local wildlife just by noticing it as it flies by or hearing a call. A friend of mine is extremely active on Nextdoor and boy, do I admire his fortitude on that social, like toxic corner of the social media spectrum. <laughs> Yo. Um, but he has been extremely successful in opening people's eyes to the nature that's all around them. He's become one of the most recognizable photographers in our area. We photographed this Western screech owl together. This is in like downtown San Rafael in Marin County. This female hangs out in a sycamore tree um, just right above the sidewalk, and she doesn't mind people walking by or anything. And this is an urban owl and uh, living in a tree surrounded by houses. And we use this photo to talk to people about why they shouldn't use rodenticides, right? It could be this species, could this animal could very easily be killed um, by one person not understanding their impact on nature. Don't forget about the snakes. Sharing beautiful photos of our common snake species like this California king, um, they help, it helps raise awareness of how beautiful snakes are, remove some of that negative stigma that's so prevalent in our world. So this one's from my parents' property out in Calaveras County. And this is a California red-sided garter. I share this at the farmer's market all the time since this photo was taken in Marin. This is one of my local snakes. Um, I'd say a good like 97% of people who I tell this snake is in Marin are completely shocked. Um, I use that opportunity to educate them about the species here in our backyards and what they can do if they just open their eyes and watch where they walk. Now, if you have the opportunity to go further abroad, there's wildlife nearly everywhere you go. Can't speak much for Antarctica. I think it's just a wasteland, but anyway, <laughs> it's too cold for snakes. That's all I think about. Um, I can't recommend travel enough. There's penguins down there, but like, it's just, there's no snakes. So I don't know. Um, I can't recommend travel enough. Yeah, I tend to concentrate my vacations around photography, mainly looking at snakes. Um, and I am what is called an ecotourist. Uh, this is a Peruvian rainbow boa in the Peruvian Amazon. This species is super common in the pet trade, but man, is it cool to see in the wild. There is responsible, sustainable ecotourism, and there's bad tourism. The IUCN has issued some guidelines for evaluating nature-oriented uh, travel. It's important to keep these in mind while planning trips. 
Uh, these guidelines are all in the name of respect, respect for the natural environment, respect for the local people. Even if you're going with a local tour company, there are some that who are better than others at those two aspects of respect. So this photo was taken in Ranthambhur National Park, Rajasthan, India in 2019. Um, let's go into a little bit of the Ranthambhur style of ecotourism. Because I'm sure many of you think that the photo on the left is not great. I like it. I call it the Ranthambhur Circus. It might look bad, but this style of tourism is protecting wild species, protecting land for them to live in, protecting them from poachers, keeping tourists to a manageable level. Tourists are prohibited from stepping off the Jeeps. The tour guides are paid well. They like their jobs. They're going to have their operating licenses revoked if any of the strict rules are broken. Um, our tiger, this one here on the right, she rested a football field away for two and a half hours, sleeping under a tree. Two and a half hours later, she decided to stand up and walk towards us, and she ended up drinking, right, like 100 feet away from me. And the park was about to close. The guides didn't want to break the rules. We drove away from her, jeeps roaring, still drinking, still chilling. And she had the park to herself at night. You know, I think about this study often. These re researchers found that non-motorized recreation activities like snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, they actually resulted in higher disturbance to ungulates than motorized recreation activities like snowmobiling. Higher, higher for the non-motorized. And the crux of that reason that I like Rathambore and that model of ecotourism is here. The animals were able to hear the motorized equipment coming. They weren't surprised when they were encountered. It's the same for the tigers in Rathambore. They are warned by the engines of the loud Jeeps. They know the roads where the Jeeps are permitted to be on. They can easily avoid these areas that they want to. I think that's really cool. And I think we can all agree that this is not okay. <laughs> If you don't know why this model of ecotourism is not okay, Google it. It's not okay. Cool, thanks. This segues nicely into our final section of my talk, the ethics of it all. Ethics, what a broad term. It's been debated since Aristotle and Plato. If you haven't watched The Good Place, go ahead and do that because it's a great show. Uh, different cultures and religions may have different opinions on what ethical behavior is. Different subjects require different standards of ethics. Patience, education, understanding are the basics of ethical behavior in wildlife photography. If there's one hot button issue in wildlife, issue in wildlife photography, it's ethics. Everybody has a different standard. So you're at my talk, you get my standard. So to me, this is what ethical photo photographic practice is. First, do no harm. It's the Hippocratic Oath. We should be living by these immortal words and our photographic practice as well. In my opinion, one of these photos is ethical and the other isn't. The story on the left is that a guy literally plucked a great crested grebe off of its nest and photographed it like this. The photo on the right, I'm holding on to the tail of an endangered salt marsh harvest mouse while assisting on some research. Both of these photos show a captive animal, they, one, one that can't escape. From research on salties, however, my coworker has shown that holding it by the tail is the safest, best way to hold them. Um, I don't know much about birds, but like, I don't think anyone likes to be gripped by a neck. So one of these things is causing harm and the other one, at least I hope it isn't, isn't. So that brings me to my first way to do no harm. Don't mess with it if you don't have to. I'm talking to you, Herpers. If you're a Herper, I'm sure you felt that little inner child go, catch it, whenever you see something running. And that's, yeah, that's me. I used to say, must grab, must grab it, grab it, grab it, grab it. But I've spent many years trying to quash that instinct and instead taking a second to stop and evaluate. So many incredible photos can be taken of in situ animals. Take a moment to watch the behavior of that animal. See what it's doing. Where is it going? Is it foraging? Is it looking for a mate? So cool to just see it go. Um, find new ways to shoot. Keep disturbance to a minimum. This is a green tree python from Australia photographed in situ in ambush position. And here's how we found it. And here's how we left it. Um, I don't like using flash, a whole nother can of worms, but um, I use low powered LED light boxes and a long exposure. So this is about a 15 second exposure with me light painting with a very low light LED. Um, so yeah, personal, personal preference on that one. But here's one of my most, my, here's one of my most well-known photos. This is a Colorado desert sidewinder completely in situ. I didn't mess with it. I left it exactly like this. I'm not saying you can never handle animals for photos. As many of you know, I often pose my herp subjects. I've shown more than a few post snakes in this talk. Uh, with many species, handling is a good way to get an engaging photo. My comment here is to try the in situ before you mess with the animal and keep the animal's well-being in mind. 
Second way to do no harm is a biggie if you're a bird or mammal photographer. Don't mess with babies, dens, or nests. This is a photo of black naped Orioles. I did, I did not take this photo. Um, there, it's a perfect shot. Not a twig, not a leaf blocking the photo. Perfectly, you know, just the animals. It's great. There's a reason for that. The photographer, by his own admission, had trimmed every single stray leaf and twig and made what he called the nest, quote unquote, bald. That's a problem. A week later, a conservationist came back to look at that nest. At least one chick was dead and the parent was seen removing it from the nest. Birds nest in very specific areas for very specific reasons. And if you screw up those microhabitats, there's a problem. It's not just pruning. These are Northern Spotted Owls in Marin. Uh, they, dwell in, they dwell in dense, dark forests. Even here in California, there are reports of owl photographers shining lights on roosting owls, or even worse, baiting them in order to get action shots or find where their nests are. That's a problem. If you're doing it for research, okay, I get that. You know, there are some things you have to do for research, but if you're just Joe Schmo and a wildlife photographer baiting, photo, baiting animals for your photos, it's unethical. Um, and also this is an endangered species, but both the feds and state, so it's also illegal. Um, the photographers are having a direct lasting impact on these species and the pursuit of one good photo for their own ego. This photo was taken during the day, no artificial lighting, no baiting, not to toot my own horn, but look at how awesome it is. <laughs> it's not the sharpest shot, nor the most well lit. I don't give a hoot. See what I did there? It's actually more of a winning with this species, but hey. Um, another important way to photograph ethically during baby season is not post locations and wait to post to social media. I took this babe photo of a baby coyote a few weeks ago on Point Reyes. You better believe I won't post it until like the summer, like until that den is long gone and the babies are gone and they are just out of there. I'm not going to post it because there, this area would get mobbed by looky loos and they would destroy the den or disturb it. All right, next way to do no harm, don't go impacting the environment for your photos. Might seem obvious, but take only photos, leave nothing, not even footprints. An important way to do this is decon your gear. We forget about this all the time unless we're doing research, but you know, there's been a few observations of snake fungal disease in the state of California, especially in this species, the California king snake. And the leading theory on how snake fungal disease is spreading is herpers not deconning their gear between sites. We're actually actively killing the thing that we love most. That's a problem. So decon your gear, um, pick seeds off your clothes before leaving. Don't lead to the spread of invasive weeds. As I said, wash your gear, clean your boots, get all that mud, dirt, crud off your boots between sites so you're not spreading those pathogens from site to site. Maybe use like a spray bottle of alcohol to decon your boots between sites. Allow stuff to completely dry if you're going through aquatic habitats. I mean, look at that picture of chytrid. Chytrid was spread to many of our environments by people not deconning their aquatic gear from site to site. That's an aquatic pathogen. Even just letting it dry for two weeks um, will kill most aquatic pathogens. But yeah, there's a lot of nuances there too. Um, <laughs> but these, uh, and the last thing I'll say is just travel ethically, like we talked about earlier. Whether you're traveling domestically or abroad, travel ethically. And these points aren't just for photography and research. This stuff is all about ethical naturalists. Everybody should be practicing these in our daily lives. I also encourage you to talk to your local communities, talk to your hiking partners who aren't biologists about deconning gear, removing seeds, and doing these little things that can really make a difference. We all love being outside. We all go hiking in so many different environments. Let's protect them. Next, be aware of your behavior. You as a biologist and a photographer are seen as an expert in your field. That means your behavior sets the standard of what ethical behavior in the field looks like. In addition, as a photographer, the reputation of everyone in this hobby depends on your shoulders, is on your shoulders. Don't give us a bad name. For example, this winter, my partner and I went to go look for some overwintering monarchs in Santa Cruz County. The monarch trees in this grove were roped off a sensitive habitat. I was photographing butterflies on the outside of the rope when I watched a guy literally cross the line. And I said, I asked him like, what are you doing? Please like, stay on the other side of the rope. He goes, oh, it's okay. I'm a wildlife photographer. And he had his camera in his hand. I'm like, no, that's not okay. So am I. And I pulled out my gear too. <laughs> like, It's not okay. Don't be that guy. Next, be aware of the animal's behavior. If you're photographing an owl and it flushes away from you, don't chase it down. 
friend of mine told me he watched a bunch of photographers run after a great gray owl in Yellowstone as it flew from perch to perch to perch to perch. The species is usually quite tolerant of humans, but um, so am I. And I'd be pretty pissed if I kept trying to escape and these little apes kept following me all the way around. Like, I'd be pretty mad about them. I took this photo looking up from a very busy trail the one time he looked down at me and he wasn't bothered, just curious. After I took this photo, he settled down and went to sleep. Not all photos are perfect. Nature isn't perfect. Take the shot you have, not the shot you want. This is a Japanese giant salamander in situ. I went to Japan in April, ostensibly for a family vacation, uh, but uh, not gonna lie, my real target was finding Japanese giant salamanders. Um, we ended up seeing eight of them in one night. This photo was the best one I got. We weren't permitted to touch them. They all had to be photographed in swift rivers at night while wearing oversized waders and carrying expensive camera gear. Uh, it wasn't easy. I had a completely different photo in mind when I went to go shoot these, um, but you take the sh shot you've got, not the shot you want. You don't sacrifice the health of the animal or, the, or messing with endangered species when you're not permitted to do so. Don't break the law break, and uh, don't mess with the animal. Just deal with the cards you're dealt. All right, we're coming to the end of my talk. So some final takeaways. First off, if you plan on making this into a full-time living, good luck. <laughs> Second is find the story in every photo. Find the reason why you wanna take that photo. Find the science in the art. Next, wildlife photography. It's an important tool to educate your local community about nature that's all around them. Think of the conservation brand awareness pyramid. Travel sustainably with the local biological environment and the local cultural environment in mind. And finally, no matter what skill level you are, be an ethical photographer. So earlier this year, I had the opportunity um, to go to Namibia and I got a little bit of fame with this photo. This is a Perengue's adder hiding in the sand. It's a staged photo. We captured the animal. After photographing him for a while, he would sidewind away. We'd bring him back. He did that famous, if anybody knows about Prangay's adders, they shuffle into the sand and they bury. And if you actually, if I showed you an actual picture of this snake, it's almost like a halibut where their eyes and their nostrils are on the top of their head more, right? They're not on the sides like a, a normal snake because they have evolved to bury into this loose sand. Um, posted on Facebook, not expecting much. It blew up. First came the dodo. Then came Petapixel and then My Modern Met. And all of them picked this up. It went viral, which is great. But look at the title of these pieces. This photo could have so easily been spun with the tagline of deadly snake, hades in the sand, gonna kill ya. It didn't because the my, I, they wanted my photo. And I said, yes, you can have it if I can control the narrative. And I was able, and with the author's blessing and great font great on them to change this photo into an educational piece about the snake its evolution and how freaking cool it is and it was great I actually looked at a lot of the comments on this photo and most of them were super positive so take the platforms you're given to preach the good word about biodiversity don't sensationalize it say exactly what it is be truthful I mean this literally can make somebody go from all snakes are terrifying to look at how beautiful this is that's awesome so I'll leave you with our original three questions. Why are you photographing wildlife? What impact are you having while you photograph wildlife? And what impact do you and your photos have on your audience? Of course, I missed the slide in three. And that's it. Thank you so much for your attention. Right on time at five minutes early. <laughs> so, if anyone. Hmm. Uh, did you have to get the quote license plate to get somebody else to photo list? No, I was just drinking a lot of beer that night. And I just bought my first car and decided on Crote instead. <laughs> <laughs> the person next to me in that photo does have Crote list, but she has a heart instead of the A, which is wonderful. Marissa, yeah. if you could um, repeat the questions. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Zoom. Zoom was, uh, did I have to get Crote because Crote list was taken from my license plate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have a tip for decontaminating electronics like your phone or your camera? The question is, do I have any advice for deconning gear, especially electronic equipment? That's a very tough question. Um, the answer is no, um, besides just using alcohol. So above 70% alpha ethanol, which is great. You can do that on a lot of electronics. Like, I, I mean, cell phones these days, my iPhone, I can put it under running water and wash it with soap and water. It's great. Um, 
But yeah, it's a great point. I mean, you talk about all your touch services. We all know about touch now because of COVID, thanks. Um, but we want to make sure that all those services that we touch are get deconned. My bag, for example, like putting my bag down in all my ecosystems, you got to just decon the cover of that bag. So it's a great question. And it's that's a hard question because it's really hard. It's not very attainable for the lo for like public to be able to do that. But I think we should start making that more of a norm. Yeah. Yeah. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, I'm curious about, especially the intersection of art and science, and when you're traveling abroad, what does it look like for? Are you ever having to get permits, or ever having to think on that level of interacting with the animals, especially when you're posing and capturing? The question is, do I ever ever have to think about getting permits when I'm traveling abroad when I want to pose snakes? Great question. Um, some countries are very strict, very, very, very strict. Some countries are very lax. Um, I mostly go, like, I, I tend to like to go with tour groups. Um, and for example, Namibia is with this excellent tour group called Baddest Birding or the Naturalist Collection, and they have permits for everything. It's one thing that I double checked before I went is to make sure that they have permits so I could handle everything. Um, Australia, forget about it. Forget about it. It is, you cannot touch anything. And the government is extremely strict. I was in Australia and I was literally talking to a researcher and he goes, Hey, do you know this guy, Derek? And I said, yeah, Derek's a good friend of mine. He goes, is he a poacher? I'm like, no, not that I know. He's just a wildlife photographer. He goes, oh, well, evidently he posted a picture of a snake. And now the Australian government thinks he's a poacher and there's a bolo out for his arrest across the entire country. So that's Australia. I mean, the Australia, like a lot of my photos are in situ. I did find a friend who did have permits and I was able to handle some stuff under his permit. But um, yeah, Australia, it just depends on the regulatory landscape. I don't think that if I actually tried to apply for a permit for myself to go photograph at my level, being a hobbyist, that I'd actually get anything. It would probably be six months of red tape. So you just have to know the country you're going to. Great question though. Yeah. Have you ever, when traveling, encountered um, some really unsustainable or unethical uh, ecotourist companies or organizations and what did you do in that situation? It's a great question. So the question is, have I ever encountered unsustainable or un unethical ecotourism organizations in, those in countries that I've traveled in? Um, the answer is yes and no. Um, there are, for example, if I'm looking at reptiles specifically, um, there's very few tour groups that specialize in reptiles. And there are some tour groups who are birders, but they sometimes dabble in reptiles. And I've encountered those before. And I can tell you like the practices that they use to handle the snakes. I see a lot of pinning. I see a lot of pinning, which um, unless you're taking venom, which is basically grabbing a snake by the back of their head, um, especially a venomous snake, and like pinning them right there. And unless you're taking, you're doing research or doing something with venom, there's really no reason to pin, um, especially if you're just a hobbyist in the field. There's a lot of really sensitive bones in the back of a head like that. And uh, you can really do some serious damage. So um, I've seen tour, like tourists, like I've heard of and seen different tour operators doing that kind of behavior. And at that point, you just sit back and you educate if you have that opportunity or, you know, you don't recommend those tour groups to your friends who are going out and wanting to see those animals. So um, truly unethical. I've heard of some people like baiting and shining, and I don't like those. But again, I've never been in front of them to actually do anything. I'm not going to dox them online without having some clear proof. But um, yeah, there are people. I mean, there's definitely tour operators out there that will bait, that will shine, that will like, you know, harm nocturnal animals that will bug them, that trapping, all this kind of stuff. And that's not great. Any questions in chat? Nope. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marissa. <laughs>